Thank you, Horst, and thank you, Spiros. <clears throat> um, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We move from diagnostic uncertainties to therapeutic uh, uncertainties in the next two lectures. I'm not really sure if ablation should, become, should be first and endoscopic resection should be next. As you will see in your, in, during my presentation, I think endoscopic resection is the key decisive endoscopic approach, and ablation is only an adjunct to endoscopic resection. I think this is the treatment algorithm we now accept as the optimal way to approach a patient with high-grade dysplasia or early cancer in Barrett's. We do an endoscopic resection of the visible lesion, and once we get approval from our pathologist that we're dealing with a mucosal cancer, then we decide on additional adjunctive ablation therapy. And RFA is currently the best evaluated tool for that, either with the balloon and then subsequently followed with the balloon or with the focal device until the whole Barrett segment has been converted into squamous mucosa. Endoscopic resection is not only the first step of your therapy, but more importantly, it's your final step in the diagnostic workup because it's the only reliable way to distinguish a mucosal cancer from a submucosal cancer. EOS, CT scan, no matter what type of imaging modality you have, the positive and negative predictive value of these techniques are simply not good enough to manage your patients. You need to resect it, either endoscopically or surgically. That's the only way that you will be able to distinguish a mucosal cancer with a low risk of local lymph node metastases from submucosal cancers that have a much higher rate of lymph node metastases and then generally need a different approach. We also know that we should not just remove the focal lesion from the Barrett's, but that in the end we need to get rid of the whole Barrett segment. Otherwise, we will just be facing uh, additional lesions elsewhere during the follow-up. So the accepted approach is to combine endoscopic resection with ablation, or at least to get rid of the whole Barrett segment. So this is what we did in the past. We used EMR cap techniques to remove the lesion, and then at least we try to use PDT, uh, photodynamic therapy to get rid of the whole Barrett segment. This is one of the few successful cases we had in Amsterdam with 5 ALA PDT. Uh, we stopped using that, I think, nine years ago. Here's where we stand nowadays, I think, and Stefan will, Stefan Zewald in the next lecture will probably provide you more details. I think we're using a much more easy and effective endoscopic resection technique using multiband mucosectomy doesn't require submucosal injection, and it's just easier and just as good as EMR cap or ESD, and then use RFA for getting rid of the Barrett segment. RFA either with the balloon-based device or with the focal device to patch up the Barrett segment. Again, with the patient being given high-dose PPI to convert the ablated tissue into squamous mucosa. RFA has been one of the few devices that made it all the way from the development stage through preclinical studies to well-validated randomized trials into a commercially accepted tool into guidelines over the last decade. It's been extensively studied with publications in high-quality journals, in different settings, with different participation of different centers. Here's one that we will likely publish in the upcoming months. It shows the experience in Europe, in which we had 13 centers, all with an accepted tertiary referral function for management of early Barrett's neoplasia to treat patients with endoscopic resection and RFA for patients with high-grade dysplasia and cancer. 132 patients were enrolled. Complete removal of dysplasia, very good, but also complete removal of the whole Barrett segment endoscopic complete removal, and no IM in any of the subsequent biopsies in over 90% of patients. And during a significant duration of follow-up, most of the patients that achieved complete remission of dysplasia and IM actually persisted in that. So here's one of the examples of the first, one of the earliest cases we treated in Amsterdam patient with a nodular lesion best seen in the retroflex view. You do your endoscopic resection, shown to be a mucosal cancer, and only then you do your ablation. You're not in a particular rush to get rid of the Barrett segment. We generally schedule a patient every three months. We tell them that we probably need nine months or maybe even a year before we can get rid of the whole Barrett segment. 
We're not treating the disease, we're preventing the disease. And this is how this patient ended up. And if you compare this image here with this image here, especially with this projection, and this cancer here with a retroflex view, you would simply not have guessed that this patient ever had a Barrett's esophagus, nor that he ever had a cancer. And this is now eight years after treatment. So now we have accepted endoscopic treatment for high-grade dysplasia and early cancer, just provided that you select your case as well. So your high-grade dysplasia and absence of visible abnormalities need to be confirmed. Just please prevent overdiagnosis. Don't accept a single biopsy high-grade dysplasia diagnosis as an indication for treatment. And for early cancer, you just have to find a cancer. There's, there's virtually no early cancers that do not have an endoscopic visible abnormality, and that visible abnormality needs to be resected and not ablated. Then again, with the success of this treatment approach for high-grade dysplasia and early cancer, the, question, the logical question then came up, what do we do with low-grade dysplasia? And the general idea is that the cancer risk of these patients is significantly less than that of high-grade dysplasia patients, and that these patients therefore have less to gain and more to lose, and therefore should not be done outside clinical trials. Both Partik and Michael have already elaborated on this. It's simply a tough diagnosis to make by pathologists. But if pathologists agree, then the risk of progression increases dramatically. If one out of three says it's low grade, but the other two says it's not, there's no progression. If two out of three agree, or if all three agree, the rate of progression increases dramatically. Now this is quite an old study, so we repeated that in Amsterdam. We took from six community hospitals, all diagnoses of low-grade dysplasia that had been made within a period of three or four years. And then we had all those biopsies reviewed by two expert pathologists, and they downgraded 75% of these to non-dysplastic Barrett's. So although the community pathologist says it's low-grade, the panel said it's non-dysplastic. And only in 15% of cases, the diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia was confirmed. Now, since we had follow-up on these patients, significant follow-up of these patients, we could also tell how well this predicted progression. And what we found is if those patients that initially had low grades, so these patients were getting annual endoscopies for, a, for a, well, what, they, what we thought was low grade, but it was actually downgraded as non-dysplastic, and their risk is just the normal risk of a non-dysplastic Barrett's patient. But then these 15%, these really had a very scary progression rate. 42% progressed, 13% per year. So the bottom line is, low-grade dysplasia is overdiagnosed, but it's underestimated. And these two go hand in hand. If you overdiagnose it, you underestimate the true relevance of the disease. It's like saying that chloric acid is non-toxic because it's in drinking water. But if you take your toilet cleaner, that same chloric acid is pretty toxic. So we need to get rid of the patients that are overdiagnosed, and then we might deal with these patients in a proper manner. Next logical thing was then to do a randomized study, but then to focus that randomized study on those patients in whom the diagnosis was confirmed by a panel, either doing standard surveillance at six and then annual endoscopies, or just the approach as I've shown you with circumferential ablation and focal ablation, and then follow up every year. Study was run in nine European centers and has been published in JAMA in March this year. Study was pre, uh, closed at an early stage after two years of follow-up because in the RFA arm, one out of 68 patients progressed to uh, cancer versus 27% in those patients in whom we only did the surveillance endoscopy. And here's the kaplan meier curve for that. Progression to cancer only was a secondary endpoint, but even that was found to be statistically significant. So to circle back, treatment of low-grade dysplasia, not outside clinical trials, I think we were surpassed that. I think if your low-grade dysplasia patient is properly selected, and that's a problem that we still face. I fully agree with what Pratik is putting up. If you cannot make a reliable diagnosis, you should not treat, but that, that means that we should focus on what a true clinical problem is, making a reliable diagnosis, either by providing 
um, pathology panels like we're doing in the Netherlands. We have an online web-based advisory panel for all low-grade dysplasia diagnoses in our country, and it's in our guidelines that you have to submit the biopsies to the panel. So this is how we should implement this in order to improve making the diagnosis. But I do think if the diagnosis is properly made, especially if the patient has it at multiple times during endoscopy, or as Michael is showing you, if, it, if the patient has it at multiple levels during an endoscopy, or a combination of the two, that will even further increase the risk of that patient truly having low-grade dysplasia. And if that patient has a significant life expectancy, he's just waiting for his cancer to occur. There's no difference between low-grade and high-grade dysplasia in that respect. The indications for treatment for high-grade and low-grade should be the same. Should all high-grades and low-grades be treated? Certainly not. But the decision-making should be individualized, and there should be no difference between a true low-grade and a true high-grade. So then, what about non-dysplastic Barrett's? Well, I think recent studies have shown that Barrett's is simply an overestimated disease. It's not such an ugly disease. The chances that a patient will get an esophageal cancer with a Barrett's esophagus is not that high if you look at his annual risk. But it's probably cumulative over time. If you have 15%, 15 years of uh, follow-up, then the risk significantly increases. How many of our patients have 15 years of follow-up? The classical example is that everybody's saying a 50-year-old male with a 8 centimeter Barrett's, that patient truly has a significant risk, and I agree on that. But I have very few 50-year-old Barrett's patients. Most of the patients I see are old, have comorbidity, are obese, cardiovascular risk factors. And we don't know over the last decade what has happened by giving them aspirin, NSAIDs, and PPIs, what that does for their risk. I think if we would sit down now, if we would discover Barrett's esophagus now as a possible pre-malignant disease, we would have very few arguments to justify the surveillance policy that we, that we have implemented over the last decades. So if we don't agree on the efficacy of surveillance for these patients, I think we should be very careful in accepting treatment for these patients. And I think non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus is only in very rare cases a good indication for treatment. Yes, if the patient is young, certainly if he has a longer Barrett segment, and for sure if he has a positive family history, in my hands in Amsterdam, for every patient we treat, maybe one in a hundred will have a non-dysplastic Barrett's, and I think I treated about five or six over the last eight years. So what should you do in your practice? There are several new ablation tools knocking at your door. Hybrid APC, as I demonstrated yesterday, and there will be new companies entering into the scenery because there's money to be made, and yes, there are good indications for ablation treatment. Please be conservative. Don't make your patient worry more than they're already doing. First, tell them the true risk of Barrett's, and then you learn to do a proper Barrett endoscopy. Listen to what Pratik Sharma showed you, how you should be looking, how you should be classifying these, uh, these patients endoscopically. Make sure that your patients that are in a surveillance program, that they then come back, not every year, but at least every three to five years. Train your pathologist. And then again, most importantly, centralize treatment. Not everybody should jump on this bandwagon. Few endoscopists are skilled to do endoscopic resection RFA. And these treatment modalities, they are just part of the game. The imaging, the endoscopic detection of early lesions, these are crucial. And well, they simply don't show on this projection, but they are so subtle and so, so difficult to detect. If you will be ablating them, you will be missing out on submucosal cancers that you need to send to surgery. And the same goes for the follow-up. You need to detect residual disease or recurrent disease at an early stage. And most importantly, your pathologist needs to get a certain exposure to EMR specimens to, in order to be qualified as an expert. If you will be doing only two or three EMRs a year, don't do them. Not only you will not be qualified, but your pathologist will not be qualified to make the diagnosis. You may want to check out this uh, website. It's a European training program overseen by a group of experts. Yes, commercially supported by companies like Covidian and a couple of other companies, but the program on this website is independent. And 
this website has lots of examples on imaging, lots of examples on treatment, not only ablation, but also EMR, also ESD. It also tells you how you should manage squamous neoplasia, and we're working on a module for pathologists. Most of the slides I've shown you on this presentation, and some of the slides you may have seen me present at other occasions, all of this is on the website and downloadable for free as a PDF for you to use. So if you have an interest in this field, at least spend some time on this website and then still consider if you m meet the quality criteria for an expert center to treat these cases. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Jack, for your excellent overview and also reflecting the increasing level of evidence and management of uh, Barrett's and the practical recommendations. So now I ask uh, Stefan Siewald from the Hirsch London Clinic in Zurich, and he will talk about.